Yesterday, at 3.41 local time, a small Russian patrol boat saw something impossible on its radar. Not an airplane, not a warship, a tiny blip. It moved like a fly. It moved like a ghost. The bridge operators did not know what to do. A dark sea, a cold sky, a handful of dots on a screen that would soon rewrite what modern war looks like. Seconds later, the drone operator's feed exploded with light. Five missiles left a launcher in a scream of heat and fire. Precision weapons worth tens of millions of rubles raced over black water. They were launched at targets that radar told them were real. They fell short. They missed. In the morning, the Russians would count the wreckage and the burned electronics and ask how cheap drones had made them look so helpless. The drones were FPV craft. First-person view pilots saw the world through tiny cameras. They flew low. They flew fast. They skimmed the waves. They hugged the land. Their goal was the summit of Mount Atri. On that mount sat domes and dishes that were the crown jewels of a regional air defense network. They were built to see missiles at high altitude. They were built to see fighters far out at sea. They were not built for tiny electric motors flying an inch above the water. On the beach below, a Pantsir S1 rotated its radar dish in alarm. This is no ancient relic. It is a point defense system designed to stop cruise missiles, to kill incoming threats before they hit valuable targets. Tonight, it fired everything. Surface-to-air missiles left the tubes. They traced white lines across the dark. They passed under and over and through the paths the drones took. Proximity fuses that needed a large radar reflection did not detonate. The drones returned almost nothing. They returned the radar signature of a laptop, not a truck. The missiles could not find their target. The radar had a flaw that was pure geometry and physics. Radars do two things. They detect energy reflected back, and they measure how that reflection changes over time. That change is radial velocity, how fast an object moves toward or away from the radar. When something moves mostly sideways across the beam, radial velocity drops to near zero. To the tracking computer, it looks like the ground. It looks like clutter, so the system filters it out. The drone flew across the beam at 50 meters. It created a Doppler notch. The radar's math made the drone disappear. Worse, radar waves bouncing off the sea made false images. The computer tried to average the real blip and its reflection. The missiles were sent into empty air between them. The tiny radar return of a sub-iPhone drone could not trigger a warhead built to explode on the size of a car. The missiles were blind. On the thermal screen, Mount Artery is filled with heat. The domes stood like giant golf balls. Inside those domes were radars worth hundreds of millions. They were designed to survive bombs and cruise missiles. They were not designed for shaped charges from 5 kilogram drones striking an access panel at point-blank range. New dots bloomed on the operator's screen. The Pantsir detected them 2 kilometers away. The missiles needed 1.5 kilometers to arm. That left about 12 seconds. 12 seconds to spot, track, aim and kill objects that the system was biased to ignore. The combat rhythm that modern systems were built around, detect, designate, engage, broke down into noise. A Su-30 pilot answered the scramble order. The fighter emerged from the pre-dawn darkness. The jet carried radar that could track targets at long range. It carried missiles that turned like small suns. Yet the pilot's bar's radar showed contacts that winked in and out. Each sweep saw the target. The next sweep could not. The radar needed five returns to confirm a track. The drones kept dropping below the noise floor. They vanished into static. Without a track, the fire control computer could not hand off a missile. The pilot fired anyway. An R-73 left the rail. It screamed up to Mach 2.5. The missile seeker sought heat. It looked for the thousand degree sign of a jet engine. The drone's electric motor produced 50 degrees Celsius at most. The infrared head could not see it until it was almost on top of the target. By then it was too late. The drone jinked. The missile could not correct fast enough. It veered, lost the lock, and carved empty air. The pilot tried again and again. He burned through missile inventory. He lit the Jeesh 30 cannon at 1,500 rounds per minute. Tracer belts painted motion into the night. The rounds traveled long before the drone moved. 
Every two seconds, the tiny craft jittered two or three meters. The fire control computer predicted positions based on linear motion. The drone broke that assumption. The rounds sailed past. Meanwhile, the first drone reached its target. It impacted a 96L6E radar array mounted on a vehicle. Known to NATO as Cheeseboard, this radar was a connector for long-range S400 batteries. It handled tracking and handoffs. It provided the low-altitude layer Russia needed to see things below the horizon. A shaped charge hit the antenna. Molten copper punched through printed circuits. Electronics that cost millions turned into smoking fragments in a heartbeat. The radar went silent. The pilot climbed away. His jet needed fuel. He had burned stores for no hits. On the ground, the command post on Mount Artery watched systems fail one by one. Contacts began to appear in impossible places. Radar returns popped up 10 kilometers off the coast where nothing flew. At sea, floating platforms launched more drones. From the mountain, those boats were invisible. This invisibility, again, came down to geometry. The Podliot K-1 radar could detect aircraft 300 kilometers under the right conditions. It had a minimum depression angle. Below roughly 40 Drey I meters in altitude and within 10 kilometers of shore, the radar simply could not see. The boats sailed inside that blind wedge. The radars had been built to look out, not down. They had not been built for threats rising from the sea surface. Offshore boats were not a fleet of manned ships. They were unmanned or lightly crewed relay platforms. They acted like floating cell towers. Each carried tall masts and powerful radios. They relayed encrypted commands and video between drone pilots far inland and craft operating near Crimea. Ukraine did not fly drones from Odessa with a single radio link. It used these floating relays to extend range without exposing operators. One relay boat could keep dozens of drones aloft. Three to five boats could cover a mission that reached deep into occupied airspace. The connection looked like a private network. The operators sat miles away. They watched live video and flew with millisecond latency. The relay boats themselves were clever in another way. Coastal radars had been tuned to ignore things moving under 20 knots. Civilian traffic cluttered the screens. Fishing boats and small freighters were filtered as irrelevant. The relay USVs moved at 15 knots to look like civilian traffic. For computers, they were background noise. For humans, they were nothing. To the drones, they were liftoff pads. Within minutes, swarms came from multiple directions. They did not fly strict patterns or formations. They scattered like startled birds and converged like magnets. The designers of the radars had assumed high-value targets would be attacked by missiles and aircraft approaching at altitude. Nobody had built for direct contact attacks by small-shaped charges coming from 30 meters away. The drones targeted maintenance access panels and junction boxes. These panels had been designed to be opened by crews. They were built to withstand overpressure from bombs. They were not built to resist the focused, violent punch of a shaped charge. A concentrated copper jet can deliver millions of PSI at a pinpoint. It melts through hardened steel like butter. It serves power and data lines. It shorts circuits and creates plasma channels. Insulators become conductors. A few holes in the right places can cascade into a system failure. The Nebo Dome, the meter wave radar said to counter stealth, took a hit. Its VHF array was pierced. Vital junctions burned. Without that early warning feed, S-400 batteries lost their long-range eyes. They could still hunt within tens of kilometers, but their horizon shrank. Their long reach depended on data that now no longer came. Three kilometers away, a BK-16 landing craft tried to engage. Deck guns and small arms spat fire. Its navigation radar showed dots. Its gunners aimed at phantoms and hope. The drones followed GPS waypoints confidently. They did not react to small arms. They completed their arcs with the stubbornness of missiles. One struck the bow. The explosive blew out a hatch. Another punched through a maintenance door. The deck crew could do nothing but watch. Yesterday, by 4.20, the cascade had reached a climax. Multiple radars were dead. Multiple communications nodes were smoking. The command center became an inferno. Equipment burned. Backups failed, overloaded by sudden current surges. 
When copper jets punched key power circuits, resistance dropped. Two amps became a thousand. Circuits melted. Surge currents exploded capacitors. Boxes designed to isolate failures were overcome. Servers that coordinated the region's air defense turned into charred ruins. The network that had once made layered defense effective dissolved into silence. The result was more than hardware loss. It was the collapse of a coordinated system. Air defense is not a single gun or radar. It is a chain. Acquisition radars find targets. Tracking radars hand them off. Fire control radars direct launches. Command posts coordinate responses and manage priorities. Break one link and the chain can still hold. Break many at once and the whole picture vanishes. That night, the attackers severed multiple links in a single coordinated push. There were no backups within range to plug the holes. There were no fallbacks. The defenders could only watch as expensive systems turned into smoking scrap. When the sun rose, analysts would describe a ballet of mistakes and failures. They would point to software thresholds built to filter clutter. They would point to seeker heads designed for hot engines. They would point to minimum depression angles and minimum arming distances. They would point to rules that set civilian filters and ignore slow vessels. Each of these design choices had a reason. They made sense in a world of jets and missiles, but a cheap FPV drone changes the assumptions. Cheap hardware gives rise to asymmetric tactics. This attack did not need stealth technology or exotic jammers. It used physics, not magic. It used geometry and timing and cheap electronics and a network of relay boats. It used tactics tuned to the seams of a complex system. It exposed a hard truth. Modern air defenses are only as strong as the assumptions they make. By the time responders could move, the defenders had lost their eyes and their brains. S-400 batteries sat idle without long-range feed. Mobile radars that could have filled gaps were knocked out or misdirected. The command net was a husk. The attackers had achieved their objective with low cost and high cunning. What this night showed is a lesson that will ripple beyond a mountain. It is a lesson about adaptation. When one side builds systems to combat a certain kind of threat, another side will invent a different threat that those systems cannot see. The cost is low. The risk is low. The payoff is enormous. In modern war, the cheap can humble the expensive. The small can blind the big. The future of defense will have to reckon with that reality, or the next dawn will tell an even harsher story.